<laughs> oh darn. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Harmoning with the Burnsville Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're here for our first uh, Change Makers Forum, and this is an opportunity to learn more about what it's like to serve in an appointed or elected capacity and hopefully encourage a lot more people to step up and get involved. Uh, tonight, I want to say a special thank you to our panelists who will be introduced in just a minute, but I also want to thank our committee, uh, uh, Skip Neenhouse and his fearless committee that put this together. Most of them are on the panel. And uh, to our sponsor, uh, Jeff LeFevre and IAG Commercial, and our partners at the City of Burnsville and ISD 191. So thank you to all of our volunteers and all of our partners in this. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce our moderator, Dan McElroy. Well, my uh, role will be to make a few introductory comments about the structure of local government, and then to introduce our panelists, and then we'll have some time for questions. The um, title of this has been Change Makers Making the Community Better. We don't want to imply that only government makes a community better. There are hundreds of nonprofits and faith communities and volunteer groups and philanthropies that played a major role in making the community better. But government has a clear role to play also. An old joke that Minnesotans must love government because we've got an awful lot of it. Um, we have more layers of government than most other, particularly in the metropolitan area, and then more units within our layers. For example, we have one of the largest legislators in the country with uh, 134 members of the House and 67 members of the Senate. Our friends across the border in Wisconsin have a 35-member Senate, for example. Why do we have such a big legislature? Because at the territorial legislature, they made it in 1849, they made the decision that districts should be small enough that the incumbent could ride across the district in a single day on a horse. And we have had districts based on that principle ever since. And it would not be easy to change, because asking the legislature to change that means there would be fewer of them. And in some parts of the state, districts are already much bigger than they are in the metro area, for example. We have one legislative district, Legislative District 5, that's larger than Connecticut and the southern half of Rhode Island combined, because we have one person, one vote. We also have more counties. Iowa has more than we do. They have 101. We have 87. Many states have far fewer than that. And it's the same principle. The county seat was supposed to be close enough to homesteaders and farmers and the like that they could get to the county seat and back in one day on a horse and buggy or by, uh, uh, on horseback. We have 850 cities. Um, in the last 40 years, we have had two combinations of cities, Redwood Falls combined with North Redwood Falls to become Redwood Falls, and Norwood and Young America combined to become Norwood Young America. Um, now, Alco and Newmarket is a little different story because they were townships, and when they were large enough to become a city, they decided to do it together. So they sort of came together, but that's, that's one of the reasons we have 800 and I think it's 35 or 40. Now, why do we have so many school districts? Um, because, and the concept goes back to something called consolidated school districts, at its peak, Minnesota had over 5,000 one-room schoolhouses. After World War II, the decision was made that that's not a way to provide a really high-quality education. And between a state legislative action and a court decision, those districts had to first consolidate. We went from 5,000 one-room schoolhouses to 1,000 consolidated school districts, today to about 340, 45, something like that, which have 290 superintendents because of rural districts that share superintendents. I want to get in briefly to the roles of those three units of government. We're not going to get into the role of the Met Council, for example, or kind of the macro picture joint powers agreements like the Mosquito Control District. We're going to concentrate on the three that affect our community the most, city government, county government, and school districts. The uh, start with the city. Um, Burnsville was first a township uh, called, creatively enough, Burns Township, and then Burnsville Township, and then Burnsville City. It became a township in 1858. There is some uh, controversy over whether William Byrne, a farmer on the west edge, on, his farm was on Judicial Road, and his name was spelled B-R-Y-N-E, but when the paperwork was done in Hastings, which it, it was then and still is the county seat, 
they made it B-U-R-N-S, B-I-L-L-E. Um, the um, uh, um, controversy is there were four other farmers in the neighborhood all named Burns. All Irish uh, farmers attracted to the area because there was a Catholic, in part, good farmland, but a Catholic church in Savage St. John's that's still there. Um, in the late 1950s, early 60s, Burnsville, the first population data we have is from the 1950 census. It was about 500. 1960 census, 2,400. 1970 census, 17,000. 1980 census, 35,000. 1990 census, 60,000. And it stayed pretty close to that since then. I just saw the most recent um, census numbers in Burnsville's population is 64,300, up from about 61,000 10 years ago. I think that one's still subject to one more revision or update, but that's about where we are. In the late 1950s, early 60s, the city of uh, Bloomington coveted the assessed valuation from Black Dark Power Plants and did the paperwork to annex Burnsville Township into Bloomington. <laughs> the uh, belief is that if John Pigeon, then city attorney, had done the paperwork correctly, we might be in Bloomington today. But he made a mistake on some of the paperwork, and it was sent back. They gave the Irish farmers in the neighborhood, Joe Canelli and Wally Day, and a number of others, some of whom some of us remember when they were late in their lives, um, to raise the money. Wally Day, uh, which is where Day Park is now on County Road 5 along Early Lake, mortgaged his farm to buy, pay the legal fees to have a law firm in um, South St. Paul, the Granis firm, uh, represent us to fight the annexation, to file for incorporation, and to become a city. Became a city in 1964. We moved into this building on the 25th anniversary of becoming, becoming a city in 1989. There are two forms of cities in, in Minnesota. Home rule charter cities and our larger cities, like Minneapolis and St. Paul, have sort of their own bylaws or their own constitution as to how they choose to do things. Most of the cities in the state are what are called statutory cities. And there is a reference in Chapter 431 to how cities can be organized. And there are called the traditional city. There are very few of those left. Plan A and Plan B. Burnsville is a Plan B city, which has a policy setting, mayor and council. And they retain a city manager. All the employees in the city report to the city manager. The city manager reports to the city council. They set his or her salary. They set the budget and the tax levy, make major policy decisions. Um, that's kind of how they function. When you think about who does what, cities do principally the things done closest to home. It's the first, other than, of course, the family and my mother-in-law. It's the closest thing to, you know, the governance closest to the people. Um, five major categories of things that cities uh, do, although one of them is other and miscellaneous, because they couldn't get them all into four other categories. But um, if, and if you ask people, what is it that your city does that you value most? I think there might be a little difference of opinion, but public safety would probably be at the beginning of that list. Public safety for us includes the local police department, local fire department, emergency medical service or ambulance service, and emergency preparedness, the uh, tornado sirens and the being prepared in the event there was a um, a tornado or a plane crash in the River Valley or something like that. Ambulance service is one of those things that not everyone does the same. Burnsville is one of the cities that does ambulance service with city employees and the city department and the fire department. Others do, other cities do this work in different ways. I should introduce a concept called a joint powers agreement. And it's something I think Minnesota does really well. We have a joint powers act that says cities, counties, school districts, tribal governments, Mosquito Control District, Cemetery Boards, Hospital Associations, anything that qualifies the local unit of government can enter into a contract with other local units of government to jointly provide services that serve their common people. And we have hundreds, maybe many hundreds of joint powers agreements, and Dakota County is, is fairly aggressive in that. An example of that is the emergency medical service in Apple Valley, Lakeville, and Farmington. ALF, they provide uh, ambulance services, a joint powers agreement. Um, Dispatch for Public Safety has done at Dakota, Dakota Communications, Inc., which is a joint powers agreement with most, or maybe is it all now? The all last the holdouts are, all right, all are all Including in. the townships. I believe so, yeah. That, and this only took 40 years, you know. It was a, a fairly short-term success. When I was 
mayor a long time ago. I was mayor in the last century, deep into the last century. Um, there were 14 or 15 uh, public safety dispatch centers in Dakota County. The impetus to consolidate came when radios changed. We went from analog radio to digital radio and to better computer systems and a variety of other changes. And Dakota Inc., Dakota Communications Inc. was founded and it's been a, a great success. Public safety is one issue. Another is what I lumped together as public works and utilities. Um, we have more than 250 miles of streets. Oh, I should point out, Burnsville, as cities goes, is relatively small. When the Northwest Ordinance was passed, it was decided that the uh, township would be 36 square miles. As the survey was done from south to north, they kind of equalized the size of townships along the Minnesota River. And Burnsville is only 27 square miles instead of the 36 square miles that almost all the other townships in our area are. The, in that, we have about 250 miles of city streets. Um, the city provides storm sewer service. They provide potable drinking water. You can argue whether you like it or not, but we provide drinking water. And collect sanitary sewage that's in turn over the Metropolitan Council for uh, uh, processing. Public Works and the Utilities operates that. They operate stormwater ponds. They have a wide variety of, of services to keep the physical infrastructure of the city going. Third major area is Parks and Recreation. Burnsville is a real leader in having city parks going back in the early days of the city. There was a federal funding program called LawCon, and we could get LawCon grants to buy parkland. And we bought Terrace Oaks using LawCon grants. We bought most of the land around Crystal Lake with LawCon grants. Um, Burnsville has a lot of square uh, footage or area of parks per capita because of the kind of far-reaching uh, vision of, of early uh, uh, leaders. We also have parks operated by two other entities. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service operates a large wildlife refuge along the Minnesota River. And the Three Rivers Park District has a piece of Murphy Hanrahan Park that's in the southwest corner of Burnsville. It's located here. It isn't really governed by our parks. It's a Three Rivers Park District, but they work very closely together. Fourth category has to do with buildings, building codes, building inspections, economic development. The, play, the uh, role that the city plays to keep the built environment safe and, and as consistent as possible and to attract business into the community. And then finally, that where I put miscellaneous and other includes the city clerk function that operates elections, the city manager's function, uh, human services, payroll, uh, communications, uh, and very importantly, intergovernmental relations. We do lots of things. There's a place that some of these uh, things we do together with other communities need to be regulated, and that often happens uh, in, in city government. Dan, for example, I think is our liaison to the Minnesota Valley Transit Association. Yes. Other people's are, people are involved with uh, cable television, with a variety of other things, and city government provides those connections. So that's, what am I forgetting that city government does? Is that? Parks. <laughs> well, parks and recreation I had in there. And, uh, the, that was where the law kind of story came in. And we also operate a fair number of recreation programs. Yes. We have two ice arenas and, depending on the year and the weather, six to a dozen outdoor ice uh, uh, facilities, uh, walking paths, increasingly bicycle paths, now a bicycle path that will get you across the new 35W bridge. So, uh, and, now the, and much of that isn't done alone. Burnsville Athletic Club is a partner in much of the organized sports for young people. Burnsville Minnesota Valley Figure Skating Club is involved, the Senior Center is involved, which is itself a joint powers agreement between the city and the school district. But that's in general what the city does. We get to questions, you can ask what I might have forgotten. I don't think you forgot anything. The next step up, in my <laughs> judgment, is regional services, services that make a lot more sense to be done on a regional basis than in every city, and that's where the county comes in. If you go to the county's website, you will be astonished at the long list of things the county does. Um, if nobody knew, if the legislature knew where to put it, they sent it to the counties. I think that's probably fair. Is that, you know, the miscellaneous and other. And often they send it to the counties without any money, which is a little frustrating. But the major things the county does, and the county, and I've looked at the uh, agenda of county board meeting, takes a lot of their time, are the programs around health and human service, welfare, uh, children in need of protective services, out of home placements, the human interaction. Cities generally don't have um, caseworkers or the interaction with people in need of health and services. That's a county function. The county also operates the county library system. 
and now we're going to have one county library system, including South St. Paul. That's only, I think that's a done deal, isn't it? No? The South St. Paul paper yesterday said it was a done deal, <laughs> but they haven't signed the contract yet. So anyway, we may have almost a county library system. We're close, and it's a really good library system. We also have a, one of the leading community development agencies, the CDA, which is an affordable housing uh, helper and helps communities with economic development. There's a county road system. And so why do we have city streets and county roads? And it's a matter of scope and region. If you just built County Road 42 in Burnsville and didn't consider what happened in Apple Valley or Scott County, it wouldn't be very effective. County roads are important because they allow us to connect the region as seamlessly as possible. Also provides another way of paying for things with count some county resources. One thing I forgot to mention is how this all gets paid for. City government is substantially funded with property taxes. If some other sources of revenue, they have utility fees and some other sources of revenue, occasionally will get a little state or federal aid, not very much. Counties um, financing is much more complicated. If you go to, go to county's website and click on financial reports, there is a pie graph that looks like they cut the pie for a large party because it's got a lot of wedges in it because they get funds from a, a large number of places. About 35% comes from property taxes. Uh, there is a chunk for state programs, principally human services and public health, but all, others also. They get some federal funds. They have some uh, fees for service they use this year to, in order to have a flat um, levy, use some of uh, fund balances. Dakota County, I think, can be proud of the fact it has the lowest uh, property tax rate in the seven-county metro area, I mean, much of the state. I'm not sure there are many. And this is often a problem of scale. Our 87 counties range in size from Hennepin County, with almost a million and a half people, to Traverse County, where um, the, um, I can't remember the name of the county seat. They have 3,000 people, and they're very proud of the fact they just took out their stoplight. They don't have one anymore. Oh, Wilton is the county seat. Um, but they all have to do all the things that counties have to do. The, the, the uh, population of, of Dakota County is around 400,000. But they have to do all the things that Hennepin or Ramsey has to do. And they have done that while keeping the, the tax rate down. What am I forgetting that counties do? Oh, fund justice. Uh, sheriff, county attorney. Sheriff and county attorney are elected, but their programs come out of the county's budget. The jail is a county function. Um, some of the services around, like treatment court and drug court, are county functions. I forgot that. What else? We also have uh, to provide the court facilities yeah. for the judiciary, and we have parks as well. They have regional parks, and that's another matter of scope and scale. The county has, and now we have bison. We have our own buffalo, <laughs> right? Close. Are they haven't they're, come yet? No, they're not here yet. Oh. But they, We need a paddock and a manager. And but it's been a great too? Yes. Cool. All right. And we may be the only county with buffalo in our county parks, at least in the metro area. I think it's cool. Yeah. School districts. Um, Burnsville is located in three kind of regular school districts. ISD 191, often called Burnsville Egan Savage, or properly called Burnsville Egan Savage, and that is in alphabetical order. It has about 70% of the land area in the city. The um, independent school district 196, misnamed, in my opinion, Rosemont Apple Valley Egan. Burnsville has as many kids in that district as, as, Rose, as Rosemont, certainly, and often as others. And I wanted to call it, in alphabetical order, Burnsville, Apple Valley, Egan, Rosemont Schools. And the acronym would have been BEAR, but not the wrong kind of BEAR. And, but I haven't been able to sell that yet. So you we're going to keep You would have had to add Lakeville, too, because Lakeville kids go to 196. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it'd be barrel. <laughs> We could make that work. Um, about 10% of Burnsville is in the Lakeville district, the kind of southern edge of the community south of, of Crystal Lake. And I had forgotten that some Lakeville kids go to, to uh, 196. What do school districts do? The answer is a lot. They provide elementary and um, middle school and high school. They have early childhood and kindergarten and now four-year-old kindergarten. They have huge programs for our special needs students. They have a, a daycare program through community education. They provide programs for special needs students from high school age up until the age of 21. With the city, they provide a joint powers agreement for the senior center. They're big in the transportation business, you may have seen in there. They've partnered with Smitty's and 
have been able to have enough bus drivers that your, the routes ran, which I was very uh, proud of. Uh, the Diamond Head Education Center is a hub of activity from early childhood education through the Senior Center. Great story about that and about city and county working, or city and school district working together. There was a time when we thought the population of the, of the city and the, the need for kids would be that we would have a second uh, high school. And the school district owned a site for a second high school at what is now Red Oak Park on the east side of school off, or the community off River Hills Drive. The city had an interest in buying the then bankrupt and vacant Diamond Head Shopping Center for a community center. Didn't work. We didn't get it uh, passed in a referendum. But working with the school district, the school district bought Diamond Head. It was estimated at the time we would do it that a new high school would cost $30 million. Today they run $50 million, but it, we thought we could do one for $30 million. Diamond Head, with its improvements, is between $7 and $10 million, depending on the latest and, and it is incredibly versatile, so that is a, a, a wonderful thing. And school districts also do a, an amazing amount through joint powers. We won't get into it in any great detail, but there is an intermediate school district, 917, that works with five or six school districts in the area to provide other services like vocational secondary education and other levels of special ed. So that's the bigger picture of uh, school districts. Now I want to turn it over to our panelists, and we're going to start with Abigail, we have them more, uh, uh, arranged as they're going to speak. Abigail is a member of, technically it's called the Board of Education. It is also the Board of Directors of School District 196. Abigail is active in the community, very helpful on Chamber of Commerce issues and, and others. Abigail, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to the Chamber for, um, for hosting this. This is just a great opportunity to really um, get the word out about public service. Um, so had a series of questions that we were asked to answer, and, and I just kind of jotted some general notes. Uh, my background uh, professionally is in business. I worked with a market research firm um, pre-family, and I was in client support uh, as well as sales and was responsible for um, delivering against a budgeted revenue of about $1.3 million. That was uh, two decades ago. Um, since then, um, I became a stay-at-home mom and a parent volunteer. And um, then uh, in 2013, I was appointed to the school board. Uh, 2014 was the first time that I, was, I ran and was elected. Uh, since then, I have served uh, three times as chair, once as uh, vice chair, as well as treasurer. Um, as vice chair, of course, I was responsible for uh, managing the superintendent evaluation, um, also engaging families and students and community uh, on a variety of topics um, from uh, the Vision 191 uh, levy, learning, levy for Learning, uh, as well as just general input, input on the work of the school districts, um, I always try to get out and uh, meet with families and students, um, talk with them, and just listen. Um, why did I run for school board? Why did I uh, actually apply to be appointed? Three reasons. Um, essentially, I started um, as a parent volunteer. And a couple years in, when my kids were in elementary, um, I realized that I was really spending a lot of time and enjoying it um, in the schools, in the classroom, um, helping the students and the teachers. Uh, and so when a, there was an opening on the school board, uh, my friends encouraged me to apply, and I hadn't really considered it, but when I thought about the amount of time that I was already spending volunteering in the schools and thought about my business background and understanding, of course, that boards are fiduciary, um, have fiduciary responsibilities, uh, I decided that um, between my interest as a parent as well as um, my experience in business, that would be a good match. Um, Secondly, uh, it really was, uh, well, thirdly, actually, between the, the volunteering and, and um, experience, my husband and I decided that we wanted to give back to the community and um, recognized at the time, although probably didn't fully appreciate how much of a sacrifice it was uh, for the family, um, we knew that this was our way to give back because, again, I was fortunate to be a stay-at-home mom and could invest the time and my experience in supporting the, the students across the district. Uh, and I've really enjoyed it ever since. Um, what have I learned since I was 
on the board. One thing that really, and I gave this a lot of thought, there's so much that I learned, um, that I've learned in my eight years on the, on the school board, really that there is so much support for, um, in my experience, for school board members. Um, when I was first appointed, uh, staff members, families, students were very supportive and really encouraged me. They, they, they want us to be successful. They want our schools to be successful um, because, of course, there are so many implications for successful schools in our community. Um, fellow board members um, offer a lot of um, support as well, um, both as, you know, just friends, sounding boards. Um, you know, we challenge each other. We laugh together. Um, and we commiserate when um, we face difficult decisions. Um, and I also didn't, I was not aware, and I think this is kind of, um, it's cogent for this conversation because I wasn't aware that there were, you know, other organizations to help support school board members as we navigate um, our work. So the Minnesota School Board Association is an advocacy group, but they also have development um, that they offer to school board members, new and um, tenured, just to continue to learn because, of course, things are ever changing in education. And then there's also the um, Association of Metropolitan School Districts, which is um, a conglomerate of uh, metro school districts. And school board members get together. And it's between the School Board Association and AMSD uh, really a great opportunity to connect with other board members from across the, the metro and the state and to realize, you know, wow, what I'm experiencing, we've all kind of experienced in different, similar yet and also different ways. Uh, and then also to hear the unique stories. So um, being an elected official isn't quite as, as lonely, I think, as it might be because of all that, again, all the community support and um, those other associations. Uh, final question, why should business be involved in a school board? Well, I've personally found that my experience in business has just added, um, and fellow board members, has added um, a healthy balance. Because in education, you know, there's a certain way of doing things. And, and of <coughs> course, there is change. But, um, you know, kind of you have your cycle. And then having new faces, new eyes to come in and possibly come up with um, a different way of thinking about it, whether it's um, marketing ourselves or where might there be other efficiencies that we could find in the budgeting process. How else do we look at how we spend our money and, and really recognize that as a statement of our value, values? Um, and I believe that you know, in business, business moves so quickly um, that bringing that, you know, the rapid fire from business to education, um, I've learned so much from uh, the highly trained um, professionals um, that I work with in the school district. Um, and I think we, we all learn from each other. And as long as we're all just focused on supporting our students, whatever opinion, whatever, you know, debate, um, deliberation we might have, we'll all end up stronger because of that diversity on the, um, within that, that conversation. Thank you. Our uh, next participant represents uh, city government, is a member of the city council, also active in a var wide variety of other uh, community organizations, Dan Keeley. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to the chamber. This is a, a new uh, format and idea. It kind of feels like a candidate forum in a way, <laughs> which, which I'll be experiencing next year again, I think. Um, well, um, I, uh, I got involved uh, in this community after opening a business here in 1993. I, I uh, started opening some uh, music stores from 93 to 98, and I actually moved here from Wisconsin, go Petco, uh, in 1996 into Lakeville. And, uh, and then three years later, found a home on Crystal Lake that I liked and, and moved into the Burnsville community. And uh, I joined the chamber pretty early on and um, got on the public policy committee. Uh, and at that time, the former uh, chamber president, uh, Darren Van Helden, was chairing that. And I think he worked for AAA. Um, I uh, eventually got on the board. 
uh, joined the board and was board chair in 2006 until I filed for office to run for city council. Uh, during that period of time, I also had joined the Minnesota Retailers Association board um, to just uh, get more involved in my industry. I was a retailer uh, from uh, the age of 19 on. Um, and then uh, about 2003 or four, the current board, or the uh, chamber president, Barb Obershaw, and I were having a discussion, and, and just, just out of the blue, she said, you should consider running for city council. And uh, I thought, okay, that was an interesting spark. Uh, at the time, I was volunteering for some campaigns, getting involved, but uh, ultimately, that was, um, that was the spark. That, that, that question or that comment uh, suggestion uh, coming from her um, started my mind going in a different direction, and ultimately, um, uh, I decided to, uh, to to run. But she really said, "You know, you own a business, and that's what we need. We need more of in local, uh, you know, city council is people who have signed the front side of the paycheck, who've sweated those expenses, who's you know." truly stressed out <laughs> when you when you start a business from scratch uh, there's years of, of stress um, and sweating out expenses and every dollar you spend when you're investing in or building and opening another store in my case it was I, I felt the burden and stress of oh my god what if it doesn't succeed um, and that fear of failure is what probably keeps a lot of people from uh, venturing into an entrepreneurial system uh, that is very phenomenal in, this, in the United States. And, and uh, the tax code was actually written to encourage people to go incorporate and go into business for themselves. Uh, and so um, that um, I'm, I'm from uh, Indiana originally, um, a small town, big family, seven kids. Um, I had no clue uh, that I would ever end up in public office. In fact, I'm the last guy in my high school class that anyone ever would think would end up in uh, elected office. Uh, I was pretty shy, uh, a bit of a partier, not very academically uh, state, you know, tuned in. I just had other priorities in that part of my life. But um, when I moved to Los Angeles at the age of 19, um, I, and I got my first job, uh, which was in retail, um, actually, first job in retail. Prior to that, I was selling door to door for about four or five months and learning how to sell and engage with people and knock on doors and cold call and all kinds of interesting stories. Um, I just decided that that was, you know, it was it was time to get very serious, and I started really focusing on my career and and uh, stayed in retail this whole time. So a little bit about you know my family is uh, I'm, I'm married, uh, been remarried, and I have uh, three daughters and three sons. So we have a Brady Bunch group. Uh, most of them are out of the house except for one who came home from the Marines. And um, uh, my wife and I live in the heart of the city in a townhome in part of that redeveloped area that the mayor talks very fondly of uh, and enjoy uh, life in, uh, in Burnsville in many, many, many ways. Uh, why I decided to run, uh, well, I, I, sorry, I kind of ran into that story uh, with uh, Barb Overshaw. I truly did not realize how much local government was in need of somebody who owned a business or was an executive with a business or maybe in middle management or upper management that really dealt with budgets, dealt with decisions, that kind of stuff. So um, she really pointed that out. And, and, and I, until then, I didn't really pay attention. When I started paying attention and watching city council meetings in Burnsville and in Lakeville and surrounding communities, my kids were in 196, so I was paying attention to Apple Valley uh, city council meetings, uh, I started to realize and really understand what she was saying. And, uh, and so that, uh, it, why I decided to run is I wanted to bring that voice and I wanted to do my part in making Burnsville and the community that I had uh, moved into a better. I mean, that's kind of a cliche, but I really did want to make the community better and bring my voice to the table. What have I learned? Man, a ton. Boy, when I ran, I had no idea what, you know, I had done my own budgets. I was big in spreadsheets. Uh, I'm a big numbers guy, so I do a lot of data research and analysis, and that's how I kept my business going for, for 17 years. Um, but there is so much more in a municipal budget. One of the biggest differences is really the base levy versus your annual levy increase. We deal in budgets in the private sector. You know, you're basically starting from scratch, and you build that budget. And there's a lot of carryover from the prior year of what you're doing, but ultimately you're saying, I'm starting all over with this budget. 
and uh, in municipal government uh, or at the county level, but but uh, local government, um, you know, when we deal in the discussion of next year's budget, the focus is always around what's the levy increase, not what we are currently spending, which is that core base budget, but what's the incremental increase that we're asking for, and that becomes a uh, very political Decoder, football. Explain what a levy is and how it relates to property tax. Um, it, a levy, general levy, is the levy where we get the majority of our revenue from, and it is on the value of your home or your business, your building, your property, even vacant land uh, in the city of Burnsville. And so if you're paying, let's say, uh, $3,000 for your property taxes in your home uh, last year, and we voted a increase of 4 or 5%, um, on average, if your home value was an average home value, it'll, you'll see about a 4 or 5% increase in your next year's property tax bill, uh, which many people defer through their mortgage payment into an escrow, and then uh, the escrow company takes care of your twice-a-year property tax payment. Is that City councilors are sensitive to that dollar amount of how much is the levy, and it translates to property tax. Yes. Um, I would have asked you to define it because you're the walking encyclopedia and, and you're, you've always been one of the most incredible treasured assets of this community. We're so glad that you're a part of it. I am a fairly analog era encyclopedia, however. <laughs> I'm having to work to catch up with the digital era, but I did think the audience may benefit yes. from knowing what a levy was. Absolutely. On a commercial business, I, we have a couple commercial, um, same thing. If you have a million dollar valuation, um, the property value goes up. A little dive into that, um, uh, the market forces influence that. So currently, residential homes are escalating at an 8, 9, 10% valuation uh, pace. That's what they're increasing year over year. Commercial real estate is not. Um, it's more like uh, probably in the 3% range. And then apartment buildings are somewhere in the middle. They're actually going at about a six, 5, 6% 6 range. And I'm, these numbers are pretty close. Don't quote me on them. Um, and so... Uh, your home, if we, if we pass a levy increase, we're really passing a dollar increase. We don't actually say we need 3%. We say we need X dollars, and that dollar increase is divided into the entire tax pool. In other words, every single property and the current valuation, which comes from the county, um, those dollars are divided into that. And so when we say, and you read in the newspaper, oh, Burnsville's going to have a 4.8 max tax, which is what we passed this year um, in September, and that's what our, our uh, property tax increase for the levy will be for next year, that 4.8% could end up being um, much less of a percent or much more of a percent than that, depending on the type of property you have and how its valuation has changed. So there's market forces that really move that number, but what we're setting is the 4.8 is based on these are the dollars that we need. Um, other than that, uh, backgrounds that we get to do our job are extraordinarily comprehensive. I have been incredibly impressed, especially after getting involved in National League of Cities and, and talking with my peers in other cities and, and seeing some of their background online. Um, we, uh, the city of Burnsville has always been known as a city that staff from other cities want to come to work for. Um, and it's been like that, I think, uh, for, for many decades. And when uh, <clears throat> Mr. McElroy was mayor and sat at this dais, um, I'm sure he was experiencing the same thing. Uh, we, we, when we have an open position, we have applicants from all over the metro, and they always say the same thing the job I want to get to is this position in the city of Burnsville. And that's really uh, a testament to the quality of elected officials and how they've run the city and the leadership of the city and, and, and how they treated their employees. Um, for uh, my last uh, 10 years, or maybe even longer, I've had a lot of focus on transportation. So each one of us at the dais um, takes on liaison roles. Uh, as Mr. McElroy pointed out, I'm liaison and a sworn board commissioner of the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. Um, and that has, uh, and then I'm with Metro Cities Transportation and League of Minnesota Cities and, and a few others. When you get into the, a particular area like transportation, the learning curve is huge. Uh, and there's so many moving parts and dynamics that we don't rotate 
our liaison assignments uh, very often with all of them. Some of them are a little easier to adapt to. If, uh, like Council Member Gustafson is currently our liaison to our, our CBB, our, our Experience Burnsville uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau, that's a job that is a little less of a, uh, a learning curve where after a person's been on it for three years, they might want to say, hey, I want to do something different. And another council member says, I would love to do that. When you get into transportation, and right now I think I'm on eight uh, committees, maybe nine. Uh, some of them are local. Some of them are the state of Minnesota. And one of them, uh, and actually two of them, are at the national level. And one of them is at the world level. I recently got on this year, got on the World Economic Forum's uh, Advanced Air Mobility. And that has been incredibly rewarding for me because I'm a bit of a tech junkie on, on a hobby side. I've in, enjoyed going to the Consumer Electronics Show for about a 15-year run up until some, some years ago, and, and I just I love technology. So when we're thinking drones and unmanned air taxis, that kind of technology, it's all over the web. You can look at it and you can read about it, but that, that fed into my, my passion and my hobby, so I, I was very thankful that that ended up being just uh, an unintended benefit of being in the transportation vein. Uh, one of our questions was um, why I stay. And as a four-year, a four-term, four-year term, uh, and I'm in my fourth term, or 15 years, uh, I, that was a good question. I had to stop and ask myself, why am I staying? Worried about a pro-business voice keeping in my seat. I am. I am worried that, that this seat will, uh, if I don't run, somebody who's never owned a business or been in some sort of business leadership would take it and we would lose that pro-business voice and understanding. So, um, you know, I, I want to also keep doing some things in Burrsville. There's a lot on my to-do list that I haven't yet accomplished. Lastly, well, why should you get involved to the audience? And I'm speaking to a chamber business obvious, audience because local government is like running a business more than ever in the history of America. We need business minds to help run this local government, which is a business. Um, part of the reason, budgets dominate everything we do. We spend six months in every single year on the budget cycle. And so who better to manage a budget and control a budget than someone who has done that uh, in a business, whether they owned it or an executive or a leader or a manager of it? Um, one quote pops in my mind. Uh, it's been said by everybody across the country, but Norm Coleman, I remember saying every time I heard him speak, government is run by those who show up. And that is a very true statement. Also, today in the world of politics, I think it's time for business owners to get more greater involved uh, because, uh, as James Madison said, I believe there are more instances, instances of the abridgment of freedom of people by gradual and silent encroachments by those in power than by any violent or sudden, uh, uh, sudden uh, disruptions. I mean, today we see what's going on, and it doesn't necessarily come down to school district, county, or city level all the time, but those, those peripheral pressures and the dynamics are out there. And I think it's incumbent upon any city, county, or school district to have good common sense uh, people come and offer up their services to the community to help make sure that uh, good decisions are made, good, well thought, well debated, common sense decisions that are good for the city, good for the school district, and good for the county. And uh, we need to we need that today. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Our next speaker is um, I, I'm tempted to call her an old friend, but we're not old. She's a longtime friend. We served together at the legislature for a number of years. She's been was a Lakeville city official prior to that. She is now chair of the Dakota County Board. Dakota County is governed by a board of seven members, and they choose their own chair, and it's an honor to be chosen chair. Mary Liz also has an expertise in transportation and chaired the Transportation Committee at the legislature when that was not uh, easy and that the uh, controversies were immense. Please uh, join me, the chair of the Dakota County Board, Mary Liz Holbrook. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you to the chamber. I'm sitting in today, actually, for Commissioner Workman, who due to illness is not able to be here tonight. So pardon me for a little Lakeville talk here. Um, that's the community I represent. Uh, my parents moved there in 1968. When I was 10 years old, they're still in the home that they bought back then. And uh, unlike Dan, um, whose colleagues thought he would never be an elected official, 
I was a total geek, nerd, whatever. Um, was involved in school politics starting in grade school, class president a number of years. I remember being severely disappointed when the morning and afternoon papers, the Star and the Tribune were combined into one paper. I was uh, from a very, from the time I could read, I read newspapers, very interested in current events, politics, leadership. Um, I'm fascinated by people and what makes them tick. I, my upbringing was very unique and probably contributes to that in that my parents were foster parents. Uh, they adopted two special needs kids. I also have a brother and sister, but they did um, special needs foster care. Uh, they did foster care for over 35 years, but um, we uh, for years had a variety of children in our home with physical, emotional, mental, uh, disability. So if you name a disorder or a background, I had the opportunity to uh, live with somebody from pyromaniacs to um, any variety of uh, levels of uh, disability, mental, physical. And back, and those were in the days where uh, my, parent, my dad, who was an engineer with Honeywell, figured out how to put an elevator into our house. He uh, engineered a, a ramp in the back of a 15-passenger ramp of van so the ch uh, children in wheelchairs could get into it. I mean, it, it was kind of uh, a mentality of that nobody was going to do it for you. You had to figure it out. Along with that rule was uh, what I believe got me into politics big time is kind of two things I'll talk about my family background first relative to that in that we were not a, uh, uh, allowed to complain about anything in our household unless we were willing to offer a solution and we're willing to work to make it different. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut because there is no time for uh, complaining without a plan to make it better. So I, I say I ended up in public service because I like to complain a lot, or you could put another word in there as well, but being this might be televised, I won't use that word um, in this, this, uh, this setting. But um, the other thing that happened is, uh, uh, so I, in 1968 is when we moved to Lakeville, and then when after I was married, uh, my now ex-husband and I bought a home in, in northern Lakeville by Orchard Lake, in 1986 and there was development planned in the area and it was really at a time when the community was evolving from what uh, in no disrespect to this terminology but the good old boys running the town kind of growing up into becoming a suburb and it, you know having some order and it wasn't who you know knew or whose land it was or whatever and this proposed development near our home um, just seemed to me to, there was no tree preservation. They were going to uh, put uh, assessments on uh, the people that lived on a road so a developer could knock down all the land around them and use the existing road to get to his property as opposed to assuming the cost of his own development, et cetera. So I back to my family background. I wasn't too happy about that and started showing up at city council member meetings. Um, ended up in a work session having vulgar language directed at me from one of these uh, good old boys. Um, and then about six months later, I got appointed to the planning commission. And uh, so began to try and implement policies in the community that I love so much to make sure that we had some order and and also Lakeville had the opportunity to le learn from communities that had gone before us and do things uh, differently and um, so I spent seven years on the Planning Commission and one of the things I learned that surprised me that I didn't know before I got involved in public service is I soon came to the realization that if both sides left the room mad at the end of the day that you probably did the right thing. 
that you probably got to some level of compromise where neither side, the developer or the existing homeowners in the area, nobody was completely happy, but that we uh, ended up settling on something that was reasonable that everybody could live with and, of course, uh, reflect the rules and uh, the ordinance, et cetera, that govern that. Um, one of the questions they asked us to address was why should business or chamber members be involved? And I would echo many of the things um, that uh, Dan talked about. I remember distinctly being in a work session and there was a proposal by the staff to uh, impose a screening requirement along County Road 70 in the industrial park in Lakeville. Now, screening's a pretty typical thing around, around residential developments. And, and I, I mean, I was scratching my head, because why would you need, this is an industrial park, okay? I mean, why would, and, and finally, I said to somebody, somebody said, well, it's only 10 bucks for like an 18 inch spruce, and you plant them, um, you know, 10 feet apart, and there'll be a, and I said to this person who had never signed the front of a check, do you know how many widgets a business has to make to get that $2 or that, four? I mean, the, the concept is foreign to a lot of people in that businesses have to clear a profit before they can pay anything. And so that, you know, that was a realization and um, certainly why business, you pay the bills. Um, you pay a large portion of the property taxes in the community and uh, to have a say of what's important and how the resources should be uh, distributed as important. And um, the county, I'm going to have to do just a little bit of uh, uh, bragging in that we have the lowest uh, property tax rate uh, in the state, have for four or five years. Our spending per capita is one of the lowest in the state because we don't get much state aids. And our levy uh, that we've proposed as a max levy will actually be a flat dollar amount. So where Dan talked about a percentage increase, you can talk about the dollar amount or you can talk about the rate that you have to charge. We'll have a flat dollar amount. So our actual levy rate will go down. However, given the rapid acceleration of valuation of residential property, versus the flat or declining, in fact, of some commercial or retail, uh, particularly strip malls, et cetera. What's gonna happen is the business community this year is going to most likely, in the majority cases, see a reduction in the dollar amount year to date. And because of the increased valuation of residential, even with a flat levy and a lot of new homes coming in, there will be increased uh, of a very small amount. So our residential customers or our taxpayers in Dakota County, and then we, of course when you layer on city, school district, everything else, um, we pride ourselves in Dakota County of keeping our uh, tax rate uh, low. I don't know how I am for t time. Do I got time for one story? Okay. Ooh. And then I'm going to add a story, too, because I'm proud of you, too, because I've worked really hard. And we're debt-free. We're the only county in the whole state that's debt-free. Um, that's unusual. I don't think there's very many cities that are debt-free. Are you guys debt-free? No. no? Okay. <laughs> yep. So we're debt-free, low rate. <clears throat> and so when the Vikings were looking for a new practice facility, they, as all good professional sports teams do, went looking for handouts from government for their facilities, okay? So you can't blame them for that. They all do it, whether they get stadiums built or whatever. So when they came to Dakota County to talk to us about a tax abatement, which would mean forgiveness of taxes or TIF or some kind of deal, uh, we said, well, you know, we just don't do that for anybody in Dakota County. In Dakota County, we try and keep our property tax rates low. In fact, our rate in Dakota County, now this is the rate, is half, less than half of what the rate is in Ramsey County. So, I mean, there's big disparities in even the rates. But we, our staff was able to show them at the same level of property tax 
um, exposure or cost, their facility could be 33% larger. So they could build a much larger facility for the same rate of tax, the same dollar amount of taxation that they would have had had they stayed in Hennepin County. They are wildly successful in their new facility, if anybody's driven by in 494. I also understand, given some of the changes in the downtown in their hotel, they now host all of the professional visiting teams in their uh, very successful right facility. At their own hotel. I should say, when you look at your property tax bill, and this is up last year, and it's average, but it's fairly close. The um, um, tax dollar, 34% went to the city, 20% went to the county, about 44% went to the school district in 191, and about 3% to the, all the others, but council, transit, the miscellaneous. And that 20% is really low. Part of this is that they hired the state's finance deputy finance director to be their finance director and now county administrator, and he's really tight, <laughs> Matt. Um, and so, but the county board has done that, and so you can be very proud of that. Thank you, Mary Liz. Thank you. Our last participant is not an elected official. He is a longtime volunteer. He serves on the Economic Development Commission and can address this from a different point of view. Jeff. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Thank you, Chamber, for inviting me. So it's interesting to talk about uh, these people up front and to hear what they have and, and are involved with because they're so involved and give so much of their time. And I've learned so much from them just being a part of them and being a part of the meetings uh, that they participate in. But the amount of time that they give to our communities to make it better is quite honestly astounding to me. And I think we should all be so impressed with what they do and always be thankful for what they do because they clearly have a desire to make it better. And for what they get paid and the amount of time that they spend on it, don't think for a second. It's because of the money. It's not about the money. It's because they truly want to make a difference. And they are making a difference. And I'm proud to be associated with them. And I appreciate what they do each and every day. So thank you. My background is a little bit different. I came from a pretty rough family. Um, at, when I was in seventh grade, my parents separated, and it was pretty ugly. My dad was no longer involved in our lives much, so we went from being a probably low-middle-income family to all of a sudden being a very poor family. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and she went to work in a local department store at minimum wage, and we had five kids. So it was uh, pretty tough. It was real tough growing up. And my dad, there was a lot of bitterness I had towards my dad and so forth for a lot of different reasons that someday I'll probably talk about more when, when he's deceased. But uh, it's uh, really interesting. It led me to, you know, to not like government much and uh, certainly was a difficult time growing up. I tell people that I've been blessed not because I had a lot of advantages in life. I've been blessed because I had a decent brain and a good work ethic, and that has helped me get ahead. I can remember when I was in high school, I was nominated for West Point in the Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, Senator Boswich nominated me for one and Derenberger for the other. And I had to get uh, um, references for that. So the superintendent of the school, uh, I grew up in Albert Lee, and as soon as I graduated from high school, my family moved, so I've had very little association with that. But it wasn't a, a fun environment due to the situation, the environment that we grew up in. But the superintendent had always taken a liking to me, and I, had to, I decided to ask him for a reference. And it changed my life in a way that you probably wouldn't expect. I was sitting down with him, asking him about things, and I said, you know, uh, I probably could have done better here, done better here, and if my family situation would have been better, and so forth. And after letting me go for a while, he stopped me. And he leaned back in his chair, and he was a big man. He was about six foot seven or so, as I look at Nelson over there. And uh, highly respected, he leaned back and said, you know, Jeff, I know your family, and I know everything you just said is absolutely true. But you know what, Jeff? It's an excuse. When are you going to stop excusing your life away? And I was ticked. But I've never forgotten those words, and it made a huge impact on me that, you know what, most people in life want to excuse their life away. And their circumstances are because of everybody else's fault, and it made me realize for the first time, guess what? My destiny is in my hands and my hands only. So what are you going to do about it? When are you going to stop being part of the problem and part of the solution? And it woke me up. And I went on to undergraduate school. I came back here and went to, and got my MBA from the University of Minnesota. 
I always did pretty well in school, but I, uh, was, I was the first one in my family of five and even my parents to get a college degree. And there were just, again, weren't a lot of advantages in school. My parents never gave me a dime for college, undergrad or graduate, and so you just kind of made a way for yourself. But when we got married, we've been married now 34 years. Uh, yes, I am that old. And uh, 34 years, and we moved to Burnsville. We moved right on Burnsville Parkway in the Park Place Apartments. We were, they were brand new. We got to pick out our wall covering <laughs> and everything. And we lived in Burnsville for about a year and a half. And then we moved to an, uh, a new home in Lakeville. And uh, that was great to live in a new home and so forth and be a part of that and see that whole development start to take off off 160th and uh, see it really take off. But there was no room and nobody was planning for parks. And so I got involved with the Park and Rec Commission for Lakeville to really start to talk about how important it was to lay out parks, plan for parks, put a uh, bike trail system down and how important that was. And it started, to, you know, I was one of many people that spoke that and it start, started to get some real headway. But I'm in the commercial real estate industry and I have been for longer than 30 years. At some point it starts to work against me, so we'll just leave it at 30. <laughs> and um, it's a big part of my life. My world is downtown St. Paul to downtown Minneapolis to kind of the 35E, 35, 94, 35 stretch. And I spent a lot, of, a lot of time along that corridor. And so for me, it was nice to be close to that. And so after about five years in Lakeville, we decided to sell our home and buy a house in Burnsville, which we live in Chelsea Court off of uh, uh, 13. And it's been great, and we love backing up against the nature preserve and, and so forth. It's been wonderful. But our community, I'm really um, proud of our community. And you hear the majority of people that I am around like to complain about it. And I have traveled most of this country. I've traveled a number of places in the world. I used to do a lot of site selection work. I'd leave on a Sunday night and come home on a Friday night, and being in five states and 20 cities or whatever, just a lot of work. I've traveled all over the country. I was introduced to governments and school districts and, and you name it, talking about why the business should be located there. And I have to tell you, outside of the winter that we have five months, <laughs> it's really, really tough to beat Minnesota, really tough to beat Minnesota. And I will tell you, living in the South, which I did as a kid, I lived in Texas, it's not a picnic living in the South for five months either. It's hot. And the cracks, as a young kid, I can remember the cracks in the yard. I thought that I'd fall to China if I ran and fell into one. They were that big in my mind. But we have so many wonderful things. And then specific to Burnsville, it's amazing the natural resources we have here. Those that have been around me are sick of me talking about the Minnesota River Valley. But it is amaz an amazing asset. And the bike trails that are now exist along the River Valley and now can go into Bloomington and bike on that side, and eventually it'll connect to the Egan Trail and, um, and move all the way into St. Paul and so forth. So it's an, an incredible resource just to hike down there and to see the, eagle, the bald eagles and so forth is amazing. But I've kind of said, you know, for our community, there's so many natural resources with Buck Hill and the lakes. We have a wonderful community. Is it perfect? No. Are there things to improve? Yes, and I want to be a part of that. And so that's how I got involved. I got involved with the Economic Development Commission. Skip and I have been friends a long time. I think Skip, Skip was the one that probably encouraged me to get involved. I eventually got involved with the uh, Experience Burnsville, the Convention Visitors Bureau, and became president of that bureau and was involved, and that was terrific as well. But because I have a company, and I'm a, it's a growing company, and working hard every day to grow it, my time is limited. But I have a lot of knowledge about commercial real estate and the real estate world. I don't have a lot of knowledge about residential. I can spell residential, but that's about it. But um, I do have a lot of knowledge, and I wanted to make our community better in a way that I could do that. And so I've tried to get involved here and there at different ways. And guess what? We are making it better, and it is making it better. And so much in life, people give up. You know, when things aren't going the way they want, they're out of here. They're gone. And I just never live life that way. I just don't think it's the way you make things better. I don't think you make your family better that way. I don't think you make your community better that way. All of us have within us the ability to make a difference, and we want to make a difference. And at the end of the day, what more counts than that to know that we go out of this world in making a positive difference in the people that we interact with, the communities that we live in, and leaving it better than we found it. So for us, that's how come I've gotten involved, um, why I've gotten involved. I've learned a tremendous amount in getting involved. I just enjoy every minute of it. I wish I had more time. I don't. I'm always limited on my time because of my work commitments. But for all of you, 
don't be a person that just complains. Don't be a person that tags along with 95% of the population and all they want to do is complain about this and complain about that. When are you going to stop making an excuse and when are you going to start to be part of the solution? And I've never forgotten the challenge that he put in front of me. Stop excusing your life away. And I put that same challenge in front of all of you that are listening in tonight or sitting in the audience. Let's make a difference. Let's make it better because we have an amazing community with incredible assets, natural resources. The way our government is run is fabulous. Look at the stability of our government. You, don't, you take that for granted until you've visited other cities across the country and you see that's not the norm in many places. So there's just a lot of things to celebrate, but a lot of ways to make it better for everybody. I'm a classic example. You know, my, my curve was probably to be poor, to be uneducated, and to uh, kind of be what I, my, my least favorite word in the English vocabulary, a loser. But I never wanted to be that, and I took it upon myself to try to be something different. And hopefully I have been, but that's why I've been involved, and that's why I'm proud of this community. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks to our panelists. If we can give our panelists a round of applause, please. Let me bring Jennifer Harmoning back for some closing comments. Then we'll go to a break and then discussion with those in the audience. Jennifer. And before Mr. McElroy escapes completely here, <laughs> I know he tried to escape without giving uh, his background. There's a reason he's as knowledgeable as he is. It's because I'm so damn old. <laughs> <laughs> but would you, for the sake of those that don't know you that well, share a little bit about your background? Um, sure. Um, my wife and I moved to Burnsville in 1977, bought a business in 79, joined the Chamber of Commerce about that time and the Rotary Club, and got interested in local issues. Um, in 1980, early 81, the city decided we would uh, do a charter commission, which we've never done again, but it was an idea, should we adopt a home rule charter? And I was, went into the charter commission. It was fascinating. Would we be better served to have wards, for example, than at large members? Would we be better served to have a larger council or to have an elected parks commission or an elected water board or all you know, these whole cornucopia of decisions you can make. And we decided, no, we like it the way it is and stayed with statutory plan B. But I got to know some people. And so I um, part of a group that ran for the city council in 1982, served a four-year term on the council. I was elected mayor in 86. I was reelected in 88 and 90 and 92. Ran unopposed all four times. No one else wanted to pay the $5 filing fee, I think. Um, in 94, I ran for the legislature, and I was opposed. In fact, I was endorsed, but I had a primary because I wasn't conservative enough for some of the people in my party, but won the primary. I had a primary again in 96. Was elected in 98 and 2000 and 2002. In 02, my friend Tim Pawlenty was elected governor, and he called and said, Mac, we got this deficit. They tell me it's going to be about a billion, nine hundred million dollars, and you're good with numbers. Will you resign from the legislature, give up the committee chairman's chip, sell a couple of businesses, and come to work and take half the pay you were making in the private sector? And I said, I think I better talk to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, bride said, What a terrible idea. Of course, you have to do it. And what we said, uh, the f forecast, Tim was elected on the 2nd or 3rd of November. The new forecast came out on the 2nd of December. And it wasn't $1.9 billion. It was $4.56 in deficit, which today would be the equivalent of about a $10 billion deficit in percentage of the, of the population. And I always forget, we did a news conference, the governor and I, um, and to talk about the, the announcement of the deficit. And the first question was from Eric Escala then of WCCO Radio, and he said, whose fault is this and who do we blame? And Governor Pawlenty said, it's not about fault and it's not about blame, it's about responsibility. And I'm responsible and we'll fix it. I was standing next to him, so I think I was part of the we. And we managed to solve a $4.56 billion deficit without raising taxes. Now, we did spend some one-time money and some, I will fully admit to some budget shenanigans, but we did it. And, the theme was tough decisions today for better results tomorrow, and we got those. Stayed in the state government, first as commissioner of finance, then as chief of staff to the governor, and then as commissioner of employment and economic development. Also got appointed to the Minnesota State Board, which was a great, as a trustee, a great opportunity. When Tim retired in 2010, I didn't want to retire, so I was 
blessed to be hired as president of hospitality Minnesota and represent the hospitality industry. I did that until 18 when I retired. And I remember a few things, but I'm having fun. I think, do we set stand adjourn, Ms. Harmony, or uh, set adjourn? Let, let me just step in here and just say an, a special thank you to Mr. McElroy and for our committee for putting this together. Um, as you can tell, we have just treasures and treasures of people, and many of them sitting in this room as well, who serve on commissions and committees and have run for office and done a number of things. So thank you to everyone who served our community. And um, I put that challenge out there. We're here tonight to talk to the people in the audience, to talk to the people at home, and say, this is for use. There's something out there for you. So whether it's, um, we have these lovely handouts that I've emailed to the attendees, so you can get all the links and everything to the websites that list all the, for the school district, the county, the city, the state, different um, committees and commissions, as well as the elected office um, opportunities that are out there. And so it's a great way to serve. We need all the voices at the table. We need you there. And so please join us, step up, uh, reach out. Ch click the links on the websites, find out what the requirements are, reach out to the people who are currently serving in the offices, on the committees, on the commissions, and learn more from them because we need all the voices at the table. Thank you to everyone tonight. We will adjourn for those who are here in uh, in person to be able to enjoy the snacks. Thanks to uh, Jeff and IAG and uh, mix and mingle and answer all your questions. But thanks for everyone for coming out tonight. We are adjourned. Thank you.